let's start by setting the scene a little bit. Um, when I was much younger, I worked on the assumption that yeah, stuff works. People will make sure that stuff works. I now know that stuff works only if determined people make sure that it works. When you're dealing with contracts, stuff works, but not at all well. There are different problems. One is language. The language of contracts is dysfunctional. That's a polite way of putting it. Um, it's a hellscape of dysfunction. It's a slightly less polite way of putting it. What is the problem? Well, or where does the problem come from? Um, well, it's a function of two things. Uh, it, the legalistic mindset, which likes complexity or pseudo complexity and copy and paste because the way people draft contracts is essentially copying and pasting from precedent contracts of questionable quality and relevance. There's also a substance issue because if your language doesn't work, that suggests that the substance is going to have problems too for the same reasons. And I'll add to that the fact that just trans transactions tend to, you know, the, can contain a lot of complexity. Then there are process problems. The processes for working with contracts have traditionally been rudimentary. So those are the problems. Um, I've been focused on the language side of things. I'm in Geneva at the moment. I'm uh, thanks to the Geneva office of the law firm Oric for allowing me to park myself here. But it was actually in Geneva many years ago, you know, 23 years ago, I think, when one fateful day I thought, hmm, instead of just doing deals, how about if I look at how contract language works or doesn't work? And that, uh, that set me on my current path. Uh, at this point, one would have, if this were a really bad movie, you'd have a kind of soft focus transition 23 years past and I sit and I kind of say, oh, oh, well, that's that task done. Now we can turn to other things because indeed I've been working on guidelines for clear and concise contract language. And um, that has involved just uh, hacking away at hundreds of usages over the years, writing extensively. The, the fruit of that work is essentially the, in uh, my book, A Manual Style for Contract Drafting, published by the American Bar Association. It's now in its fourth edition. So it's sort of as if I feel like um, we now have a little spot of, of, of firm ground to park ourselves in. We have a little island in the ocean of, of dysfunction. The idea being the starting point in, in, for coherent contracts has to be guidelines for language. We're pretty much there. That's why I'm now turning my attention to the other tasks beyond that, because ultimately clear language is a means to an end. It's not an end to itself. So what are the tasks? They're drafting and reviewing contracts. I used to um, have, I used to think that the, the drafting side of things would be my primary focus, because ultimately if well, if you want to review a contract, you have to start with a draft. So I mean, ultimately, the, the, the drafting is the starting place. Why not start with that? But um, in fact, I'm finding myself focusing now on the review side of things. Um, why is that? Well, because it, it might be that reviewing is just more of a nuisance. Um, let me try and shift this window down, get it out of the way, shift this window down. Okay, so why, is, why can it be more of a nuisance? Simply because 
Well, if you consider um, you're, you're doing 10 transactions where you're drafting the contracts. It's a particular kind of transaction, a software license agreement, whatever. You, so you are going to work from your template, making whatever adjustments you need to as you go along, but you are going to be in control and it's going to be 10 variations on a theme. Change the scenario uh, where you're doing this 10 software license agreements, but the other side is drafting. And there are 10 counterparties, so you are going to get 10 different drafts. Um, and the result is that you are going to have to approach each of those drafts afresh because there's a very good chance they're going to be different. Um, let's pretend, in fact, that it's you know confidentiality agreements. Um, each draft might have different deal provisions because because some ancillary provisions can cycle in and out of even confidentiality agreements in terms of, oh, uh, it's, uh, they're big tech companies, so we're going to have uh, provisions regarding uh, no reverse engineering or a residuals clause, or maybe there's no soliciting thrown in, or maybe it's M&A, uh, no shop provisions. There are all sorts of provisions that can cycle in and out, and beyond that, Different drafts and have different ways of saying the same thing. So if you have a if you have a confidentiality agreement, maybe um, oh let's see, um, there can be um, a part uh, a section that says that how you that, that uh, to continue to qualify as confidential information disclosure has to be handled in a certain way. You could make that part of the definition of confidential information or you could handle it separately. So even drafts that say the same basic thing can have a different architecture. And then you can have all sorts of, um, well, less than ideal choices that you have to look out for. Um, even in some, you know, something as, as seemingly straightforward as confidentiality agreements can have a lot of nuances. You can find yourself looking at drafts that, that uh, use the word um, proprietary in defining confidential information, but that pertains to ownership, so it's not relevant. Um, or if you're talking about an exception to confidential information, but you talk about something being in the public domain as well, that's, a, that's another odd choice. So, so you have to keep out your eye out for, for all sorts of glitches that can appear or not appear in a given draft. So um, it's more work. And so that's perhaps why there's been more attention focused to the review side of things in in recent years. You're review so you're reviewing a draft. What are you going to be looking out for? Well, there are two things. One is the language. You want to make sure that there's nothing that creates confusion in the contract. You're not trying to turn the other side's draft into a thing of beauty. You're on the lookout for things that can, can cause problems. Then beyond that, you want to make sure that the draft reflects your interest in terms of how the deal is structured. So, language and substance. Um, in terms of the language, there's a, a universe of, of things that can cause problems. Um, it's actually the, the subject of a, a short chapter in my book, a manual style for contract drafting that uh, discusses sources of uncertain meaning in contract language. You have ambiguity, namely alternative inconsistent meanings. People can fight over what stuff means. Maybe you're not sufficiently specific in handling a particular issue. Maybe there's a mistake in, in how a particular issue is handled. You can have conflicting provisions. You cannot address a provision at all. Or you can have unnecessary vagueness. I use the word unnecessary because a word like promptly, a word like reasonable, well, they're, they're essential tools to the drafter, but you use them only when it's not feasible, it doesn't make sense to be precise. You're precise whenever you, you can be. So that is the, the universe of confusion. Some of it is purely 
a matter of um, language in terms of semantics. The other, uh, other aspects like failure to be sufficiently specific can be a function of deal issues. But either way, that is the various possible ways that things can result in confusion. Ambiguity, there are various kinds of ambiguity and we'll just go through them very briefly and just to highlight that, that part of your task as reviewer is to look for things that just, the, the provisions with, where the parties can end up arguing. So lexical ambiguity is when um, you can have disagreement over what a word or phrase actually means. We're going to look at that in more detail momentarily. So I'm going to go on to kinds of ambiguity that are more a function of the context. So antecedent ambiguity is where you're referring to something you've already mentioned in the contract, but you're sufficiently clumsy about it. People end up saying, well, what, what do you mean? Uh, these three examples are from uh, described in my book in terms of the litigation they cause thereof. Of what? This or that? Said cost. What cost are you talking about? This or that? Such sums? Which sums? These or those? You can also fight about how the contract refers to itself. This is deeply unglamorous stuff to fight over, but a disgruntled contract party will, will beat you with whatever stick it has available here under. Does that mean in accordance with this section or in accordance with this agreement? Or does it mean lower down in the contract? Herein, that in this section, in this agreement. So I'm not going to use either of those words in a contract because they always contain the potential for a fight. References to time. My book has an entire chapter on the subject, but just consider the option expires on 9 December 2019. Wait, hold on. It expires today. Do I have time? What do I do? And the answer, as far as I'm concerned, the answer is uh, don't know. Um, because whenever you refer to a point in time by reference to a day, you leave open when in the 24 hours that point in time can occur. So um, I don't want that kind of fight. So I'm going to say uh, expires at midnight at the end of 9 December or, so, or at the beginning of 9 December, whichever meaning, I'm going to state a time of day. So again, in reviewing, I'm going to make that fix too because I don't want to play the odds. I don't want to say, well, there's a bit of confusion in there and uh, it probably won't result in a fight. It just, that approach can result in your leaving all sorts of things in a draft that can potentially result in a fight. Um, there is a uh, deeply complicated chapter in the book called Ambiguity of the Part Versus the Whole. It's a function of ambiguity created by the words um, and, or, each, any, and all, and plural nouns, the result being that you can have a provision like ACME shall not dissolve subsidiary A or subsidiary B. And everyone thinks, oh, that's great. That's fine. Well, no, no complications there. But when the deal goes bad and everyone calls their lawyer, all of a sudden people start looking at this more closely and saying things like, okay, what does that mean? One possible meaning is shall not dissolve, shall not dissolve A or B or both. Don't dissolve anything, otherwise known as shall dissolve neither A nor B. That's one meaning, but another possible meaning is don't dissolve A or B. In other words, dissolve nothing or dissolve both. Don't just leave us with one. And this example is in the book and it in fact discusses how there are four possible meanings to this sentence. Um, this is not ambiguity that anyone is, is somehow born being attuned to. You only become used to it if you are deeply paranoid about it um, because it, it is worth being paranoid because people fight over this stuff. If contracts matter and enough is at stake, people will fight over ands and ors and each and any and all. Um, 
we could spend an hour on this subject alone, but instead we are going to move on to syntactic ambiguity. That is a function of um, what part of a sentence a phrase modifies, what part of a phrase a word modifies. Again, it's a, it dealt with in a chapter in my book. The issue in this example, this example featured in a, um, a litigation uh, a couple of years ago, Th the issue was, you see packing for shipment? Well, does it go on to say packing for shipment or distribution, or does the packing for also modify distribution? So in effect, it says packing for shipment or packing for distribution. Again, that might seem like a highly pedantic thing to be fighting over, but the, the, the parties to this contract providing for shipping of goods or whatever it is, thought it worthwhile taking this to court in the US. So again, people fight over this stuff. And when you're reviewing, one of the things you have to look out for is sources of confusion, not necessarily pertaining to the deal, but instead just a function of how the language works generally. Now, um, let's get back to lexical ambiguity, which is fights over specific words and phrases. So verb structures, um, I regard verb structures as the foundation of what you're trying to say. Verb structures determine the meaning that you're looking to, the kind of meaning you're looking to convey. So. I have agrees to there. Why? Simply because you can get into a fight over agrees to. There's a well-known case involving a uh, granting of a license and there was a fight over agrees to grant. Does it mean hereby grants? You're granting it when the contract is being signed or is it shall grant? It's an obligation to grant in the future. If anyone can have a fight like a, uh, a fight like that, over agrees to, I don't want to have agrees to in my contract. So in fact, you know, agrees to is just, is out. Um, and I would mark that on the other side's draft because again, I don't want to play the odds. I don't want to, um, I don't want to just say, ah, it's confusing, but hey, the odds are it won't be a problem. Uh, no, that, that, that forgiving sort of approach is what result or what, uh, can help cause disputes. Obligations versus conditions, same idea. Um, in, in terms of the, the implications of verb structures, uh, a obligation, suggest, uh, uh, when you say an obligation, you're saying, okay, you have to do this. If you don't do it, there's gonna really be a breach and potentially I'll have a remedy. A condition is very different. It says, for this other thing to happen, this thing has to happen first. Nevertheless, drafters often aren't attuned to the distinction. You'll see provisions about notifying. An uh, ACME shall notify Widgeco. Okay, that can make sense in some context because, because um, Widgeco wants to know so it can take suitable measures uh, to count, combat whatever it is. Okay, but in other contexts, an, a no giving notice just triggers a mechanism. If you don't give notice, the mechanism isn't triggered. It isn't that there is some breach giving rise to a remedy. Then th uh, third bullet point represents and warrants. Um, people who are familiar with what I do are aware that I say that represents and warrants used to introduce statements of fact um, is pointless and confusing. It just does not make sense. I've written, in 2015, I wrote a law review article that's, in which I searched high and low for some reason to say represents and warrants. Um, I found nothing, so I recommend just using states. But um, here's where I'll make a point that I will make again. Um, you're not looking to turn everything in, in, to, 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 to create, again, a thing of beauty. You are looking to fix problems. 
and for represents and warrants where I see the biggest problem, not necessarily in terms of causing some immediate fight, but just creating confusion is when you have represents and warrants followed by a bunch of enumerated clauses. And in commercial contracts, more often than not, what you have listed after ACME represents and warrants to which it goes follows is not just a bunch of statements of fact, but they can include other things like a statement of future fact. The equipment will be in good condition, which in effect is an obligation to ensure that the equipment is maintained in good condition and it should be stated that, as that. Or you can just have flat out obligations that are included in this list. All that is confusing. If you insist on using represents and warrants, then fine, but just have it be for statements of fact and put the other provisions where they belong. Agrees that? You say, what's the problem with agrees that? Well, agrees that um, is what I call throat clearing. It is a verb structure that is parked in front of what is already a self-contained provision. ACME agrees that ACME shall. All we care about is the ACME shall part. Agrees that is redundant and I keep it out of contracts. We know it's a contract. The con you'll say in the lead in the parties therefore agree as follows. We know everyone's agreeing to everything. Agrees that is redundant. And there are a bunch of other uh, throat clearing verb structures that describe in the book. Um, I'm going to get rid of them all, particularly in the, from the other side's draft, particularly agrees that because I can point to an example where a court saw a throat clearing agrees that and tried to find some inscrutable meaning in it. You can have stuff that seems somehow benign, but if the circumstances are just wrong enough, suddenly it'll be important. So a general principle if for me in reviewing the other side's draft is that I will get rid of it if I can show that it doesn't make sense and I can point to a problem it has created, either in terms of a judge going and you know, driving an opinion in the disc or ditch or the parties ending up in a fight. Um, same with the last bullet point, may meaning might. Um, may relates to discretion, but it can also pertain to um, possibility, meaning might. Um, so you can have a phrase that says, any equipment that ACME may purchase. That could be understood or misunderstood by a judge as pertaining not to possibility, but to discretion. So again, it can create confusion. It might seem, oh, rather a professorial fix, but I'm going to make that change in the other side's draft. Terms of art. Um, a source of considerable confusion. And, um, and I, these bullet points are just you know, a handful of hundreds of usages that I've had occasion to write about. Indemnify and hold harmless. That's stand as, as a fixture in, in contracts, but it is an invitation to dispute because, okay, we're, we know, you know indemnify is a, 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 has an established meaning. Hold harmless doesn't. Disgruntled contract parties use, in, use indemnify and hold harmless as a way to try and insert unintended meaning into a contract. Um, saying both of them is probably just a, a function of the redundancy that afflicts traditional contract language generally. If you look at the main US law dictionary under hold harmless, it says see indemnify. But there's always the temptation when you're using two phrases, hey, let's have a fight about it, about which each means. And, Indemnify and hold harmless has given rise to a lot of litigation. Using both is an invitation to a dispute. It's reckless to use it. You, as a reviewer, have the power, have the responsibility to make sure that you're saying what you want to say as clearly and concisely as possible. And that is not the case with indemnify and hold harmless. And then if you're, anyone who uses indemnify and hold harmless is, is likely just doing the copy and paste thing and leaving a problem, potential problem for litigators to clear up. 
efforts. Similarly, anyone familiar with my work will know that I have uh, written perhaps, too, well, never too much, but certainly a lot about efforts. Um, capping it all off um, uh, maybe four months ago with uh, a 45 page law review article on the subject. Uh, it's been a, a, it was an interesting process because efforts provisions are central to commercial contracts, but no one, whether commentators or courts, has ever tried to explain what's going on. And my law review article is essentially the first and I predict the last comprehensive uh, attempt to do so. Um, and I'm, and uh, hey, guess what? I'm also right. And what do I recommend? That, that the idea of efforts, gradations of efforts, uh, provisions involving or requiring different levels of efforts from whoever has the obligation doesn't make sense. And it's an invitation to confusion no matter what the case law happens to say. Um, so that I recommend you stick with reasonable. If anyone wants more than reasonable, in effect, they want unreasonable and they should be specific about what they want. Um, the, uh, my article goes, goes on at much greater length with all sorts of nuances. Consequential damages. Again, a fixture of commercial contracts, but I suspect that a huh, I'm, most people who consider consequential damages don't really understand the litany that is part of the provision. No consequential, direct, indirect, et cetera, et cetera, lost profits. It is an invitation to confusion. Um, and sometimes you, you see uh, provisions that just don't make sense. They refer to direct and indirect are excluded. What? So all damages, damages are excluded. Um, and the case law is complicated um, in terms of, oh, lost profits. How do they fit in thing, into things? Sometimes they be, can be consequential. Sometimes they're not. So I simply recommend that and described on my blog and in the book as well. To the extent you can just make do with a cap on damages, that is the simplest approach. Time is of the essence. Similarly, it's it's jargon, um, so it it can create confusion as to, for example, what the implications are. Okay, time is of the essence. Well, what does that mean? What happens? Um, and it can conflict with remedies provisions, for example. It can operate in a way that's unfair in terms of what someone has to forfeit. So um, just stay more clearly what you have in mind. Be specific as to the consequences. Next bullet point, willful. Um, again, that's a standard contract word, but People have had public, expensive, messy fights over willful. Does willful mean intentional or does it mean malicious, intending, intending to do wrong? So again, willful causes fights. I'd say, if I were marking up this other side's draft, let's be precise as to what you intend here. Because if people can have a fight over willful, I don't want us to not have a meaning of the minds and potentially getting into a fight. Final bullet point, hypothecate. I just threw that in there for the sheer heck of it. Um, I could have chosen dozens of other terms of art, um, but if you're, if you're granting a lien, just say you're granting a lien rather than using the verb hypothecate. Why, why bother? There are all sorts of, uh, um, terms of art that are just obscure in terms of their implications, like, uh, oh, fa favorites of mine are derogate and arrogate. I, when I first encountered them, I thought, I have no idea what they mean. There has to be a simpler way of saying what, what's involved, and lo and behold, there is. 
So whether you make the, those sorts of changes to the other side's graph really depends how eager you are for there to be a meeting of the minds. Um, I suggest that if you don't make those sorts of fixes, um, you might well have confusion over exactly what's going on. And confusion doesn't have to end up in a fight for it to be annoying. Just being confused is enough. And then you can also just well, I have what I call glitches, defined terms used but not defined or defined and not used, cross-references. That's a separate, more technical sort of level of problem that we will uh, return to in a moment. Now, what do you not care about? Stuff that doesn't result in confusion, doesn't pertain to the deal. So old-fashioned stuff, if the other side insists on putting witnesses uh, above the recitals or Oh, insist on defining party, well, not defining it at all, but even worse, defining it individually, a party and collectively the parties. All sorts of silly stuff can be in the other side's draft, but there's no point in changing it. It's just going to add time and you're probably going to aggravate the other side. Um, traditional recital of consideration, in witness whereof, or no, you know, now, excuse me, how, I'm mixing my archaisms. Now, therefore, in consideration, of the premises and there are endless ways of you know, saying something silly in different ways. Um, it is essentially pointless, but it's not going to create harm. So eh, no point in getting into a big discussion about it by striking it, though you want to keep in mind uh, the one context where consideration could be an issue when you're um, Amend, for, uh, you're, you, you are making an amendment and the other side is not getting anything. You're changing their, the prices, for example. That could result in an amendment that does not have consideration. Um, see, what, see my book for, for suggestions for that. And shall. You know, many drafters are way too fond of shall. Um, but usually that's not going to create confusion. If you have a contract that says uh, French law shall govern this, this agreement, you'll roll your eyes and say, well, we're obviously in the presence of a shall addict. I recommend using shall only to convey the meaning has a duty to, and using shall all over the place just creates a fog uh, that can uh, just complicate matters, but um, for purposes of reviewing the other side's draft, it would be uh, probably unwelcome and ultimately unnecessary for you to look to fix all their verb structures. So just focus on those that can create problems, and I've already mentioned them. And uh, same sort of thing with represents and warrants. Used to introduce statements of fact fine. Does it make sense? No. Are you going to get into a fight about it? No. And you certainly don't want to cause massive consternation in the M&A deal by striking out represents from a standard set of statements of fact and saying, ha ha, use states. No, that's uh, way too provocative. So you just focus on keep just fixing that which is broke. All right, substance. Now, we're not going to, let's see, can I exit? Oh, all right, I, I, the messages have stopped. Thank you, Preston. Um, so how does the other side's view of the transaction compare with what you think the transaction should look like? Um, and as I note in that, the. Uh, Second bullet point, there is no substitute for deal knowledge in that marking up a draft to reflect deal points just requires that you know what your deal is or if it's, if it's in flux at all, you know the universe of possibilities. So um, one point, essential point there is don't just treat the other side's draft as, as uh, you know, the totality that you're going to comment on because um, you're limiting yourself to, to the 
to the deal as articulated by the other side. Obviously, that's why it is an advantage to draft, but you don't have to you don't have to be limited, even though also it's very easy to allow yourself to be limited. You have to simply realize that the universe, the potential deal universe goes beyond what is in the other side's draft. And it can, it, it requires serious homework, uh, either you know, with respect to a particular draft or just over the course of a career to educate yourself on substantive aspects of whatever kind of transaction you're dealing with. And as a subset of that point, don't underestimate the, the, the importance of the default rules. In other words, what's going to apply if you're silent? I've had, uh, I've had serious deal makers say that they take advantage of the other side's not being aware of the default rules, for example, uh, how the uniform commercial code might, uh, as uh, implemented in the US states, play out for a particular kind of transaction. A lot of people are inclined to think, well, it's the, con the, the contract is the deal. Well, if the contract is silent, the uniform commercial code um, can can play to you, play to your advantage. Um, I'm not, you know, I, uh, we, uh, it's, we're not going to discuss it now. Uh, there, there's always the issue of gamesmanship. I mean, to what extent are you willing to take advantage of your greater knowledge as compared with the other side? That's a whole entirely separate seminar, but I think uh, taking advantage of greater knowledge is different from hoodwinking someone. Uh, I'll note here actually that it has been a long time since I have I have actually uh, done deals, so I'm providing in the, the the grand overview. If you want uh, specific knowledge on particular kinds of transactions, obviously I'm not your guy. So resources. If you're reviewing, well, um, if language is your concern, obviously there's a, a manual solve for contract drafting at your disposal. Be aware that it's you know, it's around 600 pages now. It is not the easiest book. That's because contract language is not the easiest subject. So um, it requires old-fashioned um, you know, book learning to, to work your way through it. Um, Perhaps in the future, we'll may try and make things more accessible. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, that's for language. For substance, well, there's commentary. And you'll see the little shruggy emoticon in the bullet point below that, just to signal that it's a mixed bag. And getting specific deal advice is really a function of what, happened, what, what commentary you happen to be looking at. It can be, um, well, sometimes you have to just we, uh, just sift through a lot of information to get a little bit of specific deal guidance. Playbooks are a lot more specifics. Playbooks being specific um, guidance created usually by a, uh, by a company law department um, to be used by the law department, by a, a staff of contract uh, management personnel to handle a particular kind of transaction, providing uh, how to, indicating how to response, how to respond to a particular kind of comment, uh, set of, uh, set of uh, provisions from the other side. Um, how good a playbook is, is entirely going to be a function of who prepared it. So uh, since this is contracts, obviously, I think it's fair to say you can expect um, a great variety of, uh, of standards. <sighs> so that was so far rather breathless. 
I'll now take a breath and consider, uh, okay, so what do we do now? Um, what are the prospects for review? A lot of people are paying attention to automated review of the other side's draft. The buzz phrase artificial intelligence is uh, prominently on display when, when you read discussions of, of this. So it's an exciting development. Um, I'm involved in that because I'm an advisor to Legal Sifter, who's uh, one of the companies active in this space. Um, I would just uh, add a couple of, uh, well, um, not warnings, but just, I think, uh, something to, to uh, gain a suitable context. Uh, contracts aren't amenable to a technology-only solution. I say that for purposes of drafting, the machines will not choose optimal contract language for you. The same applies to review. Um, yes, artificial intelligence is the buzz phrase, but you need expertise. And that's why I cheerfully, in terms of discussing legal sifter, I will repeatedly say that um, Legal Sifter is a, an artificial intelligence and expertise company because uh, you have to have human expertise that, that, is, that analyzes the implications of individ, individual use, uh, usages uh, in a particular context. That is not currently, and I, I, it'll be a long time before it materializes, where you're going to have just unaided uh, review of that sort, where the machines somehow tell you exactly what the, uh, provide the, the expertise component. And even the artificial intelligence component um, involves serious human input. So it's not a technology only solution. Instead, there is a lot of expertise built in. And if someone doesn't tell you where their expertise comes from, I would be wary of it. If there's some sort of backroom anonymous staff that is providing contracts expertise, I'm not going to trust it. Because as I note in that bullet point, you need the expertise, but you also need the appearance of expertise. Someone in the backroom might be the ultimate whiz in whatever kind of transaction, but unless I can, I, unless I see who they are and what their credentials are, I can't trust it. That's why um, with Legal Sifter, we've tried to be upfront about where the expertise comes from, me, but we have an, a staff of, uh, a roster of, of other subject matter experts who are contributing because ultimately, it's the human expertise that, that we're relying on. Um, also relevant can be the drafting side of things. Um, several years ago, I built a conf an automated conf confidentiality agreement, a highly customized, extensively annotated the confidentiality agreement of your dreams, uh, and perhaps it will it will rise again because we need an alternative to copy and paste, not just for drafting but also for reviewing. Because if you're reviewing a given uh, a draft for a particular kind of transaction, you might say, "Hmm, I'm offered one variant for this element of the transaction. I would like to also." I'd like to remind myself of what the alternatives are. If you could go to a, an annotated questionnaire that will present the possibilities and will show you the contract language that would kick in if you chose those alternatives, that can make you a better informed reviewer. And it's way more effective than having to wade through some treaties, uh, 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 many pages worth of commentary to find the nugget of information. Instead, 
um, it's presented in the context of contract language deal provisions so you can go directly to what you need so we'll see uh, we'll see how that plays out all right um, I would now like to let's see uh, let me see okay I am now going to show you briefly how Legal Sifter works. So here we are on uh, on Legal Sifter's website, and I am going to sift a confidentiality agreement. So I'm going to go down to the uh, let's see da, 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 where are we? Here we are. Yes, um, I think one more. There we are. So I'm going to elect to upload and sift what I've called random confidentiality agreement. And that's indeed what it is. All right, let's go. Okay, so you see it is sifting. Yeah, that takes all of a minute or two. Okay, and it is sifted, so now I, I open it. There we are. So we have random confidentiality agreement, and what are we presented with? I compare, I, I sifted this confidentiality agreement using the Confident, one of the confidentiality agreement document types, which contains a bunch of dozens of sifters, each sifter looking for a particular issue. And the result is, after you've sifted, you will have up here, you will have flagged provisions that are, are missing. And if you uh, click on a given provision, as we're here, it's a provision relating to disclosing to representatives, you will see help text, and conceivably recommend language to address it. So it's a matter of, of cycling through these missing provisions and deciding whether they're relevant to you. For example, export control. Is that relevant? Then uh, that will be of use. Then down here, we have flagged those provisions that are present. So we can look at, We can see a given, oops, excuse me, I'll scroll down, um, a given provision, and you can expand the flag to give you help text. And you'll see all the way through, many provisions are flagged, and with each provision, you have help text and recommendations. Note that the help text you're looking at now is the default help text to which I contributed, but um, a given user might well want to use their own help text or have an outside law firm contribute help text. It is uh, infinitely customizable. So what, what is the utility of this? It is simply an extra pair of eyes, not to, uh, not to turn us, you know, I don't know, have the fleet of robots taking over contract review, but just it is a review is a difficult task, often done at volume by people who won't necessarily have been extensively trained in the transactions in question. So it's an imperfect world, and Legal Sifter gives you an extra pair of eyes because it has used artificial intelligence to harness the, the technology of humanoid experts, me included to flag stuff saying it's missing or it's here and here's some stuff to bear in mind. It's just a basic fallback. So um, that sort of automated review is, I think, just a, a logical supplement. And I think I'm confident saying it's logical simply because there are a lot of people jockeying for, the, for position in this field. But as I've said, um, 
Legal Sifter can stand behind not only its technology, but, but also its expertise. And uh, I encourage others to, to, to make their expertise known to if they can. So Preston, uh, there we go. And thank you. Um, I will apologize to you and to everyone. Uh, apparently, some major technical issues for about 500 other folks who are not on the webinar who tried to get on the webinar. Uh, so uh, I will, I will we'll fix that for next time. So for those of you who are watching this as a recording in the future, I am sure that this happened today. This is not par for the course. But Ken, thank you so much for this. Um, in my fluster and, and probably in your fluster, so I know you were having some issues on your side, um, I didn't get to do the polls at the beginning. Um, which I want to do really quickly now. And so I'm going to, let me just, um, let me share my screen just for one second and uh, take the controls back if that's okay, Ken. Oh, of um, course. And ask a couple of questions of the group. So why this is so important to me um, is that uh, for us, uh, we want to be able to do more webinars like this, whether it's with with Ken or with others. Um, and, and so much of this is about us figuring out who you are and what types of presentations um, that you would you, that you're interested in. Um, before I do that, I do want to um, flash this up on the screen. Ken talked about a number of things today. Um, I just want to make sure that if, if you're not a big fan of his blog already, you should be, and that's adamsdrafting.com. Um, he talked about Legal Sifter, uh, an incredible tool. Definitely check that out. Um, he's nice enough to share his email address. Many of you submitted some questions that we'll follow up with, but that's his contact information as well. Um, and then follow up if you're not already. Um, uh, he's he's, he's in, in the world of legal tech and in contracting, there's not a lot of people who I enjoy following, and Ken is certainly one of them. So um, please uh, take a minute to, to follow him there. I'm going to launch two quick polls. Again, these are really important for us. I'm going to try to stay true here and in this in the next uh, 90 seconds or two minutes. So let me just bring these up. This helps us understand who you are. And again, this, this helps us tailor events, newsletters, webinars, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm going to launch this right now. Um, you should be seeing it on your screen, hopefully in just a second. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind participating, um, thank you so much. Excellent participation rate. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to leave it open for five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and I'll share the results. Ken, I want you to see these two in case they're interesting. Um, looks like we're at 33% in-house, 20% um, contract manager or procurement, 14% um, uh, partner associate, 15% solo practitioner, 18% other. For those of you who are on who are in the other group, would love if you could just write into the question or chat box what that other is, because uh, we're massively curious about um, uh, where everyone is coming from on this. Let me do one more here really quickly in terms of location. I know we're going to get better at the timing of the presentations in the future because um, I know many of you were in um, in Europe and in Asia and in Africa and other parts of the, of, of the globe, and so we want to do a better job of that. So I know this is going to skew towards North America because of the time, um, but nevertheless, for those of you who are, who are doing this late hours, um, want to know who you are as well. going to leave this open for just one more minute or 10 more seconds here. Thank you. Okay, let's take a look. Ken, you might find this interesting as well. Okay. Uh, by the way, if people su submitted questions, um, I'm in the excitement, you know, it would have been nice to have five minutes to answer questions. Um, if there's some way to for me to answer the questions and then you you uh, circulate a link or some such, or I'm happy to do whatever. Or should, yeah, I will forward all the questions um, and, and get those out. And apologies for not doing that, Ken. I was uh, I was on the phone with GoToWebinar trying to get the, the uh, other issues solved. Uh, and, uh, so I got a little bit uh, flustered here today on that. Um, okay, so um, I, I think to close, I just, I want to to recap that you know for many of you you're law insider users um, in some capacity and and so we really appreciate that that as many of you know we evolved our business in about 12 months ago to be just a free site into a premium site um, and so we've been really excited that now there are thousands of users who fall into that camp so um, for those of you curious and would like to learn more um, of insider premium I'm just gonna put this up on the screen for one second 
um, that we have something called Law Insider Teams that we're just launching and just announcing now, which effectively gives you unlimited access. So I know many of you are in-house, many of you um, are at firms where uh, you know maybe you're on team of 10 or 20 attorneys, um, and we now are doing a flat fee for um, through, the, through the end of December for teams, which gives you all of your associates, if you're an in-house team of 10, if you're an in-house team of 20, um, this is a big deal because it's actually $300 a year for a single user. Um, so for those of you who have been sort of on the fence about bringing this solution um, in-house to, to your legal teams, this is how much easier to do. Um, so I'll give you a chance to raise your hand if you're interested on that. And then we also just have Law Insider Premium available um, and do a 25% discount on, for those uh, folks who might be interested in upgrading. So I'm going to um, just post a last poll for those who might be interested in taking advantage of, of either of those promotions. Uh, no pressure. If it's not a good fit, if it's not a good time, that's fine. Um, but just want to, to leave those who are interested in learning more information with an opportunity to do so. So I'm going to launch this last poll. I know we're three minutes over, um, so I'll just leave this open um, for about 60 seconds. Um, Ken, thank you again for, for pre presenting today. Uh, we will be sharing the slides. We will be sharing a webinar recording. Um, we're going to give us a couple of hours to put, throw that all together. It'll go out via email, um, and you're welcome to share that internally. I will also share uh, Ken's information um, uh, is, as well. And Ken, as mentioned, I'll share the um, uh, the questions that were submitted back to you mm -hmm. so you can follow up with folks um, who submitted and we didn't get to those questions. So again, thanks everybody for your time today. Thanks uh, so much to Ken for throwing this together all the way from Geneva, Switzerland today. And uh, stay tuned for the next webinar. As soon as you close out, there is going to be a prompt uh, for more webinar feedback. Uh, tell us what you thought about it. Tell us what other webinars you'd like in the future. Um, we want to do more of these and we want them to be valuable to you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a great rest of your day or Thank evening, you. morning. Bye-bye.